Good day and welcome back to both you and Janus, the two-headed roaming god of transitions, who could understand the present by looking into the past and foresee the future. We are going to talk about the present and the future of our field, reaching and teaching, educating kids with emotional and behavioral disorders. Yes, in this second in this segment, part two of our introduction to mental health and behavioral variances, those behavior profiles that contrast with what society and its institutions deem to be appropriate, we're going to take a look at prominent explanations, theoretical frameworks, as to why some individuals are identified as having disordered and or maladaptive behavior patterns, and what is recommended in the way of interventional actions and reactions. So while I am thinking exactly what this teacher is thinking, no, no, I'm expecting this class to be the best one I've ever had. But let's focus on that question at the top of the image. Why do our kids behave as they do? Related to that question, I'm now assigning some bell work. This is your Do Now activity. I would like you to consider these two multi-part questions. The first one dealing with, well, what brings about this behavior that we deem to be inappropriate for the educational setting? Where does it come from? Why does it continue? What's driving it? And that related to that question number two, there are different theoretical frameworks for ex that purport to explain how it is that these behaviors come about, why they keep going, and what are the best interventions, the best approaches to use to help this youngster make better behavior choices. We're going to take a look at these prominent explanations as to why individuals are identified as having disordered and or maladaptive behavior patterns, and what is recommended in the way of interventional actions and reactions. So what I'd like you to do right now is to pause this presentation, consider those two questions, jot down a few notes, and restart the presentation when you've done so. Let's do what we did in part one and compare notes. We're going to take a professional peek into the various theoretical frameworks and their orthodoxy or, or doctrine, their lingo, and their planful courses of action. While theories on why folks behave as they do range from demonic possession to atmospheric conditions and phases of the moon, we are going to look at the more prominent professional models for explaining why people do what they do and what we can do about it if we feel an intervention is necessary. Let's look first at physical bodily etiologies and causations, the biogenic or biomedical model. And I'm going to ask you as we move through these slides to think faster than I talk. You'll see questions coming up. Give them some quick thought and then let's see what, uh, what we know thus far about these models. So the premise of this model is that if somebody has a behavioral disorder, a mental health issue, that it's due to something within the self, a physical causation. It is an illness, so to speak, or a reaction to an illness or ailment. So the treatments, think medical, exactly, surgery. Now, how's surgery come involved here? 
Well, one of the classic examples is the removal of this almond-sized, almond-shaped structure in the temporal lobe known as the amygdala. It is the alarm system in our brain. And for some folks, it is much too sensitive they end up flying into a rage and rather than a lobotomy which we've talked about previously they would remove this structure and it has a significant calming effect on the individual yeah we might remove a tumor that is um pressing on a motor area and causing involuntary movements. Medication. Well, which medications have you heard about? Perhaps lithium salts for individuals who are experiencing depression? Amphetamines for kids who have high activity levels and distractibility? Silert, Ritalin being some of the examples. Um, select serotonin reuptake inhibitors. What? Select specific ones. Serotonin, which we refer to as the happy hormone. It's really not a hormone, but it's a chemical which um, brings pleasure and, 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 and a soothing effect. Serotonin and reuptake we don't want it reuptake inhibitor we want to prevent the bloodstream from draining off this pleasure chemical we want to inhibit the reuptake select serotonin reuptake inhibitors now how about dietary changes well while there's no objective research proof Certainly, there's a lot of testimonials about the effects of sugar on youngsters' behavior, even though we think that perhaps it's because once youngsters have achieved something, we give them sweets during non-structured times, and it's really the lack of structure that we see these behaviors pop up. Um, we hear a lot about gluten, that when you drain the pasta in your colander and you feel that slick, slimy, kind of gooey substance, well, that's gluten and believed to have an effect on many youngsters' behavior in that it throws off their body chemistry. There's um, a lot of emerging research on the gut biome, G-U-T, B-I-O-M-E, the gut biome, and this is especially applicable to youngsters who are on the ASD, autistic spectrum disorder, who are on the spectrum, because they tend to present with greater frequency digestive issues. And there is testimonial at present and emerging research mostly with, uh, with mice and rats at present, but that changing the diet and enhancing the gut biome, the diversity of um, um, uh, bacteria, good bacteria within the abdomen, um, actually um, helps one self-manage his or her behavior. Um, environmental modifications? Well, gosh, while fluorescent lights are on in a room and I see it as a steady beam of energy, other people notice a flickering. Other people have reported that um, when in uh, fluorescent lights it causes them difficulty concentrating and that in some of our more sensitive individuals may affect their behavior. Same thing with electrical fields. Uh, we sometimes reduce the temperature in a room to reduce the chances of an eczema outbreak, a skin outbreak, for kids who act out when that flares up. As for the medical uh, effects, the medication effects, 
we will have a video that you will be watching when you poke your noses inside the module that has to do with kids with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and kids who experience some form of depression. Just about everyone is at least vaguely familiar with the psychodynamic model that behavioral issues that are demonstrated overtly are due to an imbalance, a wrongful interplay between three dynamic parts of the personality. Dynamic parts? Think Sigmund Freud. What were the three parts of the personality that he said were in play, that interacted with each other, sometimes fought with each other? That's right, the id, the superego, and the ego, which we'll address more in depth in just a little bit. But one's inappropriate outward actions can be explained in terms of subconscious, um, meaning lack of awareness to the self that we don't even realize exactly what it is that's making us feel this way and react this way. Hidden motives within the mind. Now, if you're going to be able to tap into those hidden um, motivations, how are you going to find out about them? How are you going to discover them? How are you going to learn to deal with them? That's right, psychotherapy for the individual. In this case, a child or a youth, and oftentimes the family, either separately or together. And once the individual and the microculture that surrounds that individual understand that subconscious motivation for why those behaviors are happening, once we understand them, we become more aware of them, then we can um, um, resolve them and deal with them. That note there about therapeutic school programs. Back in the early days of educating these youth, most of the programs abided by this model. Early programs had a, a highly accepting, permissive teacher who describe what the youngsters were doing. In one old movie that I was watching, a documentary, um, six or seven boys who had the label of severely emotionally disturbed were brought into a classroom or allowed into a classroom. And they said, so what are we supposed to do here? And the teacher says, you'd like to know what you're supposed to do here. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, what are we supposed to do? You're asking me what you're supposed to do. And not receiving any guidance, these youngsters then started to say, well, what would you do if I ripped this up? And the teacher says, you're asking me what I would do if you ripped that up. So the kid rips it up, and the teacher says, oh, you've just ripped the paper. Well, eventually these kids were breaking into locked cabinets to get food that was in there. And the teacher was saying, oh, you're breaking the locks on the cabinet. You're in the cabinet. You're eating food. Now, why would they do this? Well, the inappropriate actions were allowed to demonstrate that we allowed them to be demonstrated to show that this is a safe place to let your emotions out. People won't judge you here. We will listen to you and we will accept you. So early educational programs for kids with behavior disorders were based almost exclusively on the psychodynamic model. This is back in the, I'd say, 19, late 1940s to 1960s. There are probably still a few of these around. So one more time, what were those three parts of the personality? You got it. The superego, the ego, and the id. Let's look a little more deeply into this.
The id is the part of the personality of you that you're born with. The id tells you do what you want to do when you want to do it. The world revolves around you. It's your world and other people are just living in it. It's sort of how I view the world. Now the superego develops somewhere around one and a half to two years of age with toilet training. Imagine it. You are king or queen of the world, which is the case with most infants. And then society imposes its first big restriction on you. Toilet training. You do not get to do what you want to do, when and where you want to do it anymore. To quote Commander Spock of, of Star Trek fame, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. That is society talking, and they impose their rules and regulations upon you, starting with toilet training. Now, from this experience, the ego emerges. It's your decision-making part. You develop a part that tries to meet the urges of the id. I want this, and I want it now, or I want to do it in this way. While meeting societal expectations, what has been taught to you and reinforced by your religious group, your culture, the laws, the rules in the school, the, you know, the societal expectations, the super ego. And this ego is in between saying, I hear you, id, but also saying, you know, we can't quite do it that way. And we try to figure out how to meet that urge, but in a socially acceptable way. Now, some people have a strong, well-developed ego. They are self-regulated. Others tend to side more with either the superego or the id. They're very restrictive in their behavior and they abide very closely by the rules and the regulations and the expectations. Where other people side more with the id that those urges just overcome their ability to self-regulate, self-monitor and self-handle self those urges. Of course, there are situational variations too, and a classic example is people who consume alcohol. Their ego may start siding a little bit more with the id. Now, as for that toilet training experience, we may have initially resisted it, but for me at least, you know, it's come in pretty handy over the years. And if it has for you, I say, you know, why not call your parents tonight? and just say thanks. As with every theoretical framework, the psychodynamic uh, th theoretical uh, model has different uh, sub-areas, sub-models, and with the one that we were just talking about was psychoanalysis, understanding the, the, the hidden motivations and, and drives that are subconscious, below the conscious mind. And so, yes, uh, therapy, which uh, typically takes six months to two years, and some people continue on for much longer longer than that is they try to better understand themselves and, and the influence, uh, start to recognize those hidden influences. There's the action branch known as the psychoeducational branch. It's developed from a disappointment in the slow and questionable um, progress that uh, derives from therapy. They're saying, you know, while while we understand the need to be therapeutic, can't we come up with strategies and interventions and supports that teach this person how to better handle their motivations? Let's get into that branch more deeply. While psychoeducators may have trash the staunch belief in the three parts of the personality, they certainly recognize that, you know, envisioning the id, ego, and superego is an exceptional, um, 
heuristic, a, a mnemonic device for remembering and understanding the unconscious motivations and the subconscious conflicts that are happening in one's mind. But it also recognizes sort of the superego that, look, we can't continue to have these programs where kids do whatever we want while we are, discuss we are uh, describing what it is that they're doing. And so we need to create some strategies and interventions that consider the how one behaves appropriately in school and home and community and society. Uh, it uses procedures designed to change the way the person sizes up the world, tries to change them internally, their value system, and to teach them alternative behaviors that will still meet the same function as the ones deemed to be inappropriate, because we can't just say, stop doing that and do this. Kids say, oh, why would I? Because I'm getting benefits from my present behavior. Either it's positively reinforced, desirable things come to me, or um, I'm avoiding undesirable negative things. It feels good not to have those negative things impact me. Negative reinforcement. But now I'm getting into the applied behavior analysis model. I'm jumping ahead and psychoeducators have some concerns about that model. So let me pull myself back here and say that that, uh, that next to last point that you see is the most important one. We need to develop positive interpersonal relationships with our students to pull out a bit of the video that we've watched in other courses and perhaps in, in this one, educators need to find something to like in each and every kid. We need to engage in symptom separation. Oh, I hate that behavior, those symptoms, and they have to cease and desist. However, I will work with the individual to see the benefits of change and I will serve as a model for this youngster. Oh, now we're delving into the social cognitive realm, another framework that we'll discuss in just a little bit. You might be semi-familiar with some of the psychoeducational um, uh, approaches and practices. For example, one of the more the circle of courage model based on a native people's, a universal native people's life model. We will be studying this more in depth in another learning module. A particular interventional approach of the psychoeducational model is the life space interview. It was developed back in the 60s by Fritz Radl and David Weinberg. I hold them in high esteem in that I read their book, Children Who Hate, back when I was a young teacher and said, I am ready to work with aggressive, defiant, streetwise kids. They motivated me to get into that because they worked with inner city kids in Detroit. And during the summer, the youngsters would be uh, would become uh, campers up at the fresh air camps and up in the upper peninsula of Michigan. And they developed this in the moment conversation with the youngsters for structuring a discussion after an event has occurred, uh, some sort of defiance or aggression or externalizing behavior, they would in that particular moment try to make an impact, which is different from other variations on the theme, which is let the situation cool down, lets the teacher and the student go to their separate corners, and we come back later when we can, when neither one of us is contagious and we can say, hey, let, let's, let's back up the bus. 
what happened back there? Why did this behavior pop up? And why did I respond the way I did? But this, uh, the life space interview is an in the moment intervention for kids who've shown externalizing behaviors, acting out. The life space interview has since been updated by a professional descendant, a student of Fritz Radl, Nicholas Long. Dr. Long added a few more flavors to the sauce and changed the name to the Life Space Crisis Intervention. Depending upon which stage of the discussion is in, the, the path that the discussion is taking, we decide to bring in certain specific interventional uh, points to address how the conversation is going in that particular moment. Nick, who I've had the uh, pleasure of spending some professional time with, also developed the conflict cycle model for understanding why it is that teachers and students get in escalating battles and confrontations with each other. We are going to study this in depth in one of our in-person classes and also in our, one of our study modules. But a sent, to give you the, the quick overview that a stressful incident happens, stressful for the individual. Now let's talk about the student in this particular case. Well, why is it stressful? It doesn't seem the least bit stressful to us. Why is this kid overreacting? Oh, we look above that there that a lot of it has to do with what are called irrational beliefs. They may not be irrational, just that person's understanding of the world and how that influences their take on that situation, how they size up that situation. So if that incident is stressful and it happens to uh, exceed the youngster's ability to manage those emotions, those uh, feelings that are emerging, where you're going to see an observable behavior pop out and how the adult and the peers in that situation respond to that kid's behavior is either going to load on more stress and prove that youngster's irrational beliefs or reduce the stress and help to break and put a hole in the wall of those irrational beliefs. Not too long ago, this model was updated to include the student's thoughts that it relates to the irrational beliefs. But if a situation is stressful, well, how that youngster perceives where the stress came from has a lot to do with the feelings that develop. That's um, involving the cognitive behavioral model a bit something we'll be talking about in just a few minutes. Oh, why wait? Let's get to it. The cognitive behavioral model, that theoretical structure, is designed to counter stinking thinking. That you, the previous way of looking at behavior was that you're entitled to your emotions but you need to learn to deal with them differently. Let us teach you a replacement behavior. But now the cognitive behavioral model, which is gaining quite a bit of popularity, uh, now 75% of psychologists identify as um, adhering to the cognitive behavioral model where previously it was more uh, psychodynamic. But in the CBT model, how you size up a situation affects your emotions. So let's look at the, the stream of things along the bottom line there. Okay, something happens. Some circumstances present themselves. And previously we said, well, emotions come from that. Oh, he made me angry because he did this. Well, gee, why did anger develop? And again, 
anger is a secondary emotion. We say, well, why did anger develop? Well, because I was frustrated that I couldn't um, uh, complete this activity, or I was embarrassed uh, publicly. And so we get into the thoughts behind the emotion. If we can help the kid size up the situation correctly, then these negative emotions or counterproductive emotions or just um, this over these overwhelming emotions might never happen and then we wouldn't get that acting out behavior. Um, a situation from my experience, I was born and raised in a blue collar factory town and when you meet somebody there's a little bit of jocularity, a little bit of give and take, some, some minor little insult and then if you can handle that well you, you know it's like oh yeah you belong we've got the same mindset and they become friends with you but i found as i left that town when i did my little bit of poke in the ribs humor that it sometimes didn't go over well with people who had never experienced that they thought that i was attacking in that situation in which i am trying to make friends and I do a little bit of gotcha humor to someone I have just met, I suspect that their thoughts are, whoa, why did this guy attack me? I wasn't doing anything, or he's rude and uncultured, or this is highly inappropriate. And in stressful situations, emotions develop that either make them want to fight, flight, flee, or freeze. And yes, I'm sure some of them froze and stayed there and took it. Other ones found uh, acceptable ways to leave the situation. And other ones fought back with, uh, with an escalated uh, uh, response. Now in that same situation, what's the thought pattern for me? It's like, whoa, that didn't go well. I'm a little bit embarrassed that I brought that up in front of somebody of such great importance and I should honor them. Or I'm thinking, ah, this person can't take a joke. And I, therefore, am under stress and want to engage in fight, flight, or free or flee. But having, you know, talk with folks about it, from my blue collar town and uh, administrators who have called me into the office, I have been taught that from now on, I will, when I'm meeting somebody new, I will ask them questions and I will size up the situation before I respond in my default way. Find out first whether this person would be the type who would enjoy that sort of introduction. ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis, the operant school of the behavioral model. And in this school of thought, professionals believe that behavior has been learned. That it's the events that you have experienced going through life and even through the present are strengthened the behaviors you show have been strengthened by reinforcement. The vernacular would be rewards. And reinforcement, either positive, wonderful things coming to you when you show that behavior, desirable things happening, or reinforced, strengthened by negative reinforcement. The behavior avoids or escapes negative situations and circumstances. So yes, if a youngster is behaving inappropriately or in a maladaptive manner, it's because they have learned to respond in that way. So, so what's kicking it off? Why did that youngster show that behavior? And why does the kid keep showing that behavior? In, ever, in order to understand it, we engage in the ABC assessment. The B standing for, you got it, behavior. The A for antecedent, the thing that comes before the behavior, the most recent 
of the stimuli that led up to this moment, the spark that ignited the powder keg in acting out, externalizing behavior. So a the most recent stimuli, the antecedent, sparked a behavior to happen, but what's keeping it going? That's the C, the consequence, the outcome that follows the display of that behavior. ABA folks focus strictly on surface behaviors, what you can see. They don't deny that people have feelings and motivations. It's just that that is an inexact science. ABA is based upon physical science and experimentation and proof and evidence. So their treatments, the ABA procedures, are directed only at modifying the outward behaviors that we can witness, we can hear them, see them, sense them in some way. People from the psychodynamic viewpoint would say, look, you can get rid of a behavior, but the motivation behind it is still going to create another behavior to take its place. So you get rid of one thing, but it's going to create another because you haven't addressed the underlying cause. It's sort of like um, pressing in on a balloon. You can depress one side with your fingers, but it's going to pop out a bit on the other side. That's the psychodynamic view versus the behavioral view. A, B, C analysis, but what letter comes before A? Yes, that there may be a stimulus, the antecedent, the one closest to the behavior that brings about the behavior, and then there's a consequence that follows. But certain things may have led up to that incident that sparked the behavior, and those need to be considered those other stimuli, those other contributors. Uh, imagine a kid who uh, forgot to set the alarm at night. And so the alarm doesn't go off in the morning. The kid wakes up late, sees, oh my gosh, and grabs a handful of dry cereal, runs to the bus, misses it by seconds, has to walk back home and ask the parent for a ride to the school, gets yelled at by the parent arrives in school and gets chastised by the dean of students for being late and you should know better and set your alarm to go off every morning at this time. Oh, so the youngster gets the pass and is sauntering down the hallway and opens up the door and the teacher, I guess being a relative of Captain Avias, states, you're late. Oh, the, the stress, the tension is building up. Imagine the feelings that the youngster's having of inferiority, embarrassment, and a, a whole quiver full of emotions. Uh, sits down, is managing this fairly well. I mean, there might be a, a slight teardrop in the corner of the eye. But then the teacher presents material, an assignment that the youngster finds is overly challenging. This is too much. It breaks the dike and the emotional waters come, come flowing through. The kid throws the assignment on the floor, pushes the books off the table and says, screw this, I ain't doing this and ends up taking a walk back to the office. Those are the setting events. Okay, what was the antecedent in that? Well, let's always go to the B first. What was the behavior? Ah, ripping up the paper and tossing the books onto the floor. Well, what happened just before that? What happened just before we saw that observable behavior? Oh, was presented with an assignment. We don't know at this point that it was overwhelming. We'll have to do more of evaluation. But that behavior was sparked by the presentation of the assignment. And so we've got to go further back, you know, like, wow, why would somebody explode 
at just being given an assignment. They're given assignments every day. What 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 happened here? And we again review the situation and look back at everything that led up to that antecedent. But now we're saying, hey, look, you know, you're going to have bad days. All of us have that. And there's going to be something that just puts us over the edge. But what can you do instead? Oh, we can move up to desired behavior. Just put your head down and withdraw. And it, you know, ignore everything that's going on. Yeah, but that doesn't provide the youngster with an alternative that meets the function of the behavior, the expression of the emotions. And so we'll teach this youngster an alternative behavior that you call the teacher over and say, teacher, I'm really overwhelmed today and this assignment, I, I need some assistance in getting started and a behavior that meets the same function is the one that we want to promote. In Uri Brofenbrenner's ecological model, analyzing aberrant behavior is akin to assessing trouble in the natural environment with the presence of harmful substances, invasive species, and, and climate change some part of that student's ecology, the social realm surrounding that youngster is polluted or out of balance. And what we do to intervene is to look at these different ecosystems, some being more intimate than others. For example, the family being much more intimate than society, another ecosystem. And what we try to do is to clean up the pollutants, to reduce the pollution in one or more of those surrounding environments of the youngster. And so, gosh, some of the ways that we might intervene in an academic situation well, in my kids' school system, there is a medical facility in the school. It isn't just the school nurse. It is a comprehensive medical center in the school buildings. Most school buildings have free breakfast and perhaps free lunch, but in this particular school system I'm talking about, it's free for everybody. So the youngsters don't have to present their card and be identified as coming from a low-income family environment. The school also, after school, the youngsters drop by a certain room where backpacks are filled with food, supplying the home with food in homes that have difficulty um, feeding their children. And parental support is provided. The parents can drop in for counseling. Other things, gee, we could have this, get this youngster involved with positive groups like, that's right, the scouts and school clubs and, and teams, getting mentorship by big brothers or my brother's keeper, adults who volunteer to work with kids who are troubled and troubling. We provide home supports and outreach. We help the family obtain medical care. We give them nutritional knowledge. Make sure that they're getting food stamps and WIC, uh, WIC funds, women, infant, and children funds that come along with uh, welfare. Um, can we provide them some child care training? And then we want to involve other organizations with this youngster, interagency cooperation, bringing in other groups and organizations to our meetings regarding the child that might be helpful, such as officers from the probation department for some of our adolescents and, and even younger kids, community activists, cultural informants, 
people who understand that kid's cultural or religious group and can provide information as to whether these behaviors are common within that group or whether they these behaviors we see in school are indeed outliers and different from what might be expected or accepted within that group. Uh, the local medical facility uh, representative, and so forth. On this slide, we see a depiction of the different systems, the different ecologies that affect this child. The child being the center, and the home being the microsystem. But the home is influenced by religion, and other people, neighbors and friends and teachers, what's going on in the neighborhood that the mesosystems affect the microsystems. For example, our classroom is less intimate than the family, but we certainly affect family life. And then there are the, are the ecosystems, the, the people who make decisions that affect that child's life and then moving on to the macro system, society's dominant beliefs and ideologies that are oftentimes um, imposed on others who might uh, have different beliefs and ideologies, but you're here now and this is the way we do it in this country or in this society. I realize that you can't click on the link there to the YouTube video, but there, of course, there's a YouTube video for everything. You can either pause the uh, presentation right now and scribble down all those, uh, <laughs> all of those uh, uh, items, uh, letters, and numbers, and 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 such, or you can just go to YouTube and type in ecological theory or uni, uh, Uri Brofenbrenner. Albert Bandura's social cognitive model, an amalgamation of three other modules putting together, combining three other theoretical frameworks, the psychoeducational, that is, considering relationships in the mind, the ecological, that looks at the youngster's um, environmental influences, and talking about environment, there's the behavioral model that believes that how the environment responds to our actions modifies, morphs, changes, and solidifies the actions that we show. And yes, indeed, we are, are uh, molded by reciprocal interactions, give and take between the mind, the behavior, and the environment. This was first brought out by Bandura in 1977. And it takes a while for a model to gain popularity, but this one is becoming a prominent model. That yes, indeed, we realize the effects of the environment on behavior, but not just in the what we can witness. We look deeper. We look inside the mind. We look at a person's ability to think that we are higher level mammals and we can do these things at a higher level, observe, analyze, evaluate, self-reflect, think about it, think about what we're doing. That needs to be recognized. And so, yes, the consequences of our behavior, our, uh, our social influence on each other, it's all about what is known as, at least by Bandura, the triadic reciprocacy that we change the covert, the unseen, to influence the overt. We work on value systems. We work on one how one sizes up a situation. We work with the mind along with the environment. Triadic reciprocacy. Yeah, say, try saying that eight times fast. 
Yes, indeed. Bandura did look at the influence of the three factors on our behavior. The one in the upper right corner regarding bungee jumping. Perhaps you can tie it into something that you have an interest in, developed a talent in, and why it continues to be an influence on you. Um, my internal personal cognitive factors I like high-risk activities as long as there's a 99.9% .9 chance that I'm going to come out alive and uninjured. And so when I had the opportunity to learn whitewater kayaking, it was like, yeah, sure, why not? And I took instruction in it, and I met people who were interested in that and shared their knowledge and their skill base with me. And it just excited me as I'm saying, I want a higher risk now. I'm good on class two waters. Now I want to take it to class three rapids and then class four with the obstacles and, and, the, and the hazards and move up to class five rapids. And yes, I keep working on my skills and my friends are helping me. And it just is this continuing cycle, this triadic reciprocacy. How can you apply this to the things that interest you? Your personal attributes and characteristics. What you decided to learn and why you stuck with it. I'll bet you were wondering when I was going to get to this. Right, we hear the name Albert Bandura and we think of that Bobo doll in the Bobo Beatdown. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with this, it was a study at Stanford University back in 1961 with kids where they were looking into a pre-K classroom or a kindergarten classroom. In walks an adult who goes over to this inflatable weighted in the bottom doll that if you push it, it will promptly come up and stabilize itself. So the, an adult goes over to that doll, picks up a hammer, and starts hitting it for about three to five minutes, as I recollect. And then that adult leaves. The youngster is allowed into the room. Does the youngster go to the kitchen area? No. Does the youngster go to the block area? No. Does the kid go to the literacy library area? No. The youngster goes over to the Bobo doll, picks up the hammer, and attacks that figure. There is at least an illustrative uh, video. It shows the original study shows the black and white film of the adults and the children. If you pause the video and take the time to write down the, um, the configuration that you see there, the link that you see there, it is enlightening as um, this, as it is this, this event <laughs> that this experiment is explained. And Bandura expanded it to not just watching live models, but the influence of TV, of media on kids, and found out that, yes indeed, kids tend to model behaviors shown by others. There are influences. Is this model res known and respected? That has an influence. Did the model, the person engaging in the action, get reinforced or look like they were having a good time, the reinforcement? If so, there's a greater likelihood that the youngster will engage in that action. Now, I'm thinking, if I were a kid back at that age, and the adult walked over to the Bobo doll and hugged it and kissed it, I don't think that I would have done the same if I walked into that room. It's hard to know as an adult looking back. 
but is there something about my character, who I am, my personality, my gender, my training, my upbringing, whatever, that makes me drawn toward active movement versus empathy and compassion at that time? The social cognitive model has interventions that attempt to change the person on the inside. Now, we may manipulate in the environment on the outside, but we're talking about changing the way that the person assesses situations, uh, makes decisions, and so forth. There are step-by-step -step training approaches, what to do and how to do it. And we see cognitive behavioral model is included in this. It is recognized with CBT telling us that the ways we size up situations determines our emotions. And if we view a situation differently, we'll feel differently. So instead of that irritating little brat is testing me, I'm going to show him a verbal firestorm. We say to ourselves, there's a kid in crisis who needs a competent, caring mentor right now. I need to interact in a supportive manner. Wow, that change in what we say to ourselves changes the feelings that we experience. In the late 1990s, a new theoretical model came into focus. The trans-theoretical, it cuts across all the other theories that no matter where you hang your hat on the theoretical hat rack, this model applies. You can believe any of the other uh, orthodoxies and doctrines, but this model applies. So what's it all about? Well, teachers for a long time have said, look, I'm using this research-proven, evidence-based strategy with fidelity, and it ain't working with that kid. It's had no effect or minimal effect. Well, yeah, says the trans-theoretical model. You were using an intervention that was misaligned with the kid's motivational level, his or her willingness to change his or her behavior. First of all, you've got to identify what stage of willingness they're at in order to devise what strategy you will use. You can use a, a strategy from the model you particularly like, but it has to align with the kid's present motivational level to change his or her or their ways. We will be digging down deep into this model to create a greater understanding and facility in using this model as we move through our course. There is a good chance that you will come up with different answers and responses to these questions than do I. And that's okay because here in America we have rights and you have the right to be wrong. No, no, I'm just kidding. We professionals oftentimes disagree on what's appropriate and what's the best way to handle a situation, but we always have the best interest of the kid in our hearts and our minds. So when we look at the questions there, you know, are certain models better aligned with certain types and characteristics? of the behaviors that we see. Personally, uh, yeah, I, I could, I, I see that the medical model has its interventions that are needed with this particular group of youngsters. And thank goodness for applied behavior analysis that while I'm not a, a staunch adherent, I'm not a card-carrying, uh, uh, dyed-in-the-wool behaviorist, I do recognize that their model and their procedures are quite effective in changing behaviors. 
as kids become more cognitively able and more conversant, I personally like to use psychoeducational and cognitive behavioral interventions. I'm not saying any of these are right and you have to use them in the way that I do. I'm giving examples of how we might pull from one and pull from another depending on the situation and what we're presented with in the way of behaviors. And some folks, myself included, prefer the informed eclectic orientation, that it's important to know these uh, various theoretical models, to become familiar with their practice, to become um, skilled in, in the use of their practices. But that does not mean that that has to apply to you. You will make your decisions given your professional orientation, your personal characteristics. I'm glad that we are on the same team, even though sometimes we have different views on the appropriate strategy to use in that situation. As we approach the end of our time together, it's time for the lightning round. Let's take a look at these uh, descriptions and decide which model might be in play. So we've got Mr. Lee who creates this wonderful environment where the kids say, I am valued here. I am important here. And when misbehavior crops up, there's a quick reminder from him to redirect the youngsters. Um, the child, the children have their goal of the week. They try to please Mr. Lee, and that's an important part of this description. They feel connected to him. They want to please him. They trust him. Now, while we hope that shows up in all of the models, it is a central, unswerving characteristic of the psychoeducational model. Which model here? Ways behavior in multiple environments, the classroom, the home, and when he goes to uh, scouts, has been impulsive, very active. His parents are thinking, gee, you know, it's, it, he's been diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, one of the three types. Do we handle, do we accept medication? Do we administer that to our youngster? And they talk with a family physician and they've decided it's in the best interest of the child. And they're now engaging in the titration process, which is trying to adjust the dosage to get the maximum positive main effect while minimizing the side effects. Yep, you nailed it. The biogenic biomedical model using the use of pharmaceuticals to influence behavior. In our third scenario, Mrs. Papanico. She works in an institutional setting for kids at risk. And in her classroom, the kids make most of the calls, whether they want to engage in what she would like to present at that moment. They decide whether they're going to go to sleep or participate. And while she certainly tries to engage them, she's an entertaining teacher and, uh, and she's developed trust bonds with the kids. It's very non-directive. We don't place a great deal of, uh, we don't place any demands on the youngsters unless the youngster is aggressive or really distressed. And then it's time to call in the head doctor. Uh, some vernacular for our psychologist who helps the kid develop a better understanding of the, what's going on in the subconscious and why these feelings are developing. Ah, you see in that image, id, ego, and superego, and right away you've selected answer number two, the psychodynamic model. 
In this particular classroom, Signora Martinez is concerned about the tantrum behavior of Tyrese. So she takes data, she engages in behavioral recording on the when and the where and the how long, various dimensions of behavior. She also looks at what happened just before that behavior popped up and what the consequence was for that behavior. So that when they got together at a team meeting, it became apparent that the tantrums were designed to get her attention. Now, that's the function of the behavior. Now, when the tantrums, now when the tantrums occur, behavior, the behavior replacement plan, or the strategy in the BIP, the behavior intervention plan, directs that the kid is to be isolated, to be timed out and ignored. Now, they do teach an alternative behavior, and when it is shown, prompted and shown, it's recognized. However, it doesn't say whether this behavior, the new one, desired behavior, meets the same function. They may have just be saying, do this instead and reinforcing it, but if it doesn't meet the same function, it's going to be much harder to get the kid to display that behavior. So, which of the six options do we point to? Yes, indeed. The behavioral model. Applied behavior analysis. I'll take theoretical models for 400. Mr. Zabo is teaching his students how to use problem-solving steps, actual delineated practices, steps they follow when they're unsure of how to respond in situations that cause stress and tension and they have to make a decision. He's also teaching them to avoid stinking thinking. Bong! Off goes the light bulb. You folks know what we're talking about now. Yep, we're avoiding stinking thinking, the negative self-talk in which they degrade themselves and their abilities. I'm stupid. I can't do this. Why can't I do it right? We're getting rid of that type of thinking. Certainly it is the primary component of the cognitive behavioral model, but again Albert Bandura said, I like that and I'm going to include it with a couple of other models in my uh, uh, my combination model, the social cognitive. So we'd give you partial credit for uh, option number seven. In your discussion board post, one of the options to talk about is which model appeals to you more so than others. Yes, where indeed do you hang your professional hat? We're asking you does one model seem to make more sense to you than others? Is it something about your character or the characteristics of the kids that draw you to a certain model? Do you think that perhaps some models are more appropriate for certain diagnostic uh, uh, categories? or or behavior patterns and profiles. Perhaps you would select a different model and its procedures for someone who has schizophrenia versus somebody who has experienced traumatic childhood events versus somebody who is on the autism spectrum or a kid who is aggressive, defiant, manipulative, and streetwise as in conduct disorder? Would you choose different strategies from a different model for kids who experience against great anxiety or kids who um, are feeling down in the dumps very much so depression. Now it just seems to be in my, my personal contact with folks that most people are informed eclectic. That they're saying, you know, I, I could see the benefits and the drawbacks to all of the models. Uh, they may prefer one model more so than the other, but they say, you know, I can see value and utility 
in most or all of the models. Those eclectic people would use whatever practice seems to be appropriate as long as it has an evidence base and it shows concern, compassion, caring, and enthusiasm about the kid or kids that we plan to use these strategies for, these supports. <sighs> Yeah, and we see certain models as being more appropriate uh, or less appropriate, depending on the situation and the youngster. Turn out the lights, the party's over. Good golly, Miss Molly, we have reached the end of this presentation. It has been my honor, privilege, and pleasure to spend time with you good folks. Please drop by my office hours anytime if you have questions regarding this presentation or just want to talk about the most interesting, fascinating, and rewarding of all the teaching positions, working with kids who have emotional, behavioral disorders. The federal term, but use whatever term you use as long as it shows respect and compassion and enthusiasm about reaching and teaching kids who have mental health, emotional, and behavioral differences. <laughs>